Recording in progress. There we go. Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming along tonight. My name is Narelle M. Harris uh, and on behalf of the uh, Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's online author event uh, for this evening, which is me, Narelle Harris, uh, and I'll be interviewing Lucy Sussex uh, and just we'll be talking about um, the book we've done together, The Only One in the World, a Sherlock Holmes anthology. Before we get on to that, though, uh, I'd like to begin uh, with the regional, uh, the Geelong Regional Library Corporation uh, acknowledges the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which their library services operate. They pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. They acknowledge and celebrate the First Nation peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge, and story. Uh, I'd also like to add that Lucy and I are spe both speaking tonight from the country of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri people. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Um, and we've just got a few little bits of uh, housekeeping uh, before we go on with the discussion. Now, first of all, later on, after Lucy and I have had a bit of a chat, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have questions uh, while you're listening to us talk and we get down to there, you can use the Q&A function that appears at the bottom of your screen. So if you hold your mouse down uh, below, you'll see the Q&A um, uh, icon come up. So if you click on that, it'll pop out the little Q&A uh, window for you and you can use that to um, send your questions to us. Um, there's also a function on that if somebody's already asked a question that you want to ask, you can actually give that a little thumbs up to move it up the list uh, to uh, vote it up for getting asked earlier. Um, now, also, the whole webinar is being recorded, um, so you can watch this discussion again sometime uh, if you'd like to, or if you really enjoyed it, you can recommend it to friends and family, um, or I don't know, maybe if you really hated it, you can recommend it to your enemies. That also works. Um, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel uh, over the next couple of days when we've uh, had a chance to finish and you know, prep it all. Um, Right, so first of all, I guess a little bit of background about me. Um, I've been a writer uh, for a fiction for pretty much all my life. I've been getting published for about um, uh, 20, 25 years now. Uh, I write crime, horror, fantasy, romance, uh, often blends of all those. Uh, and I also work as a freelance writer and editor um, as kind of the day job. So my own works include vampire novels, erotic spy adventures, um, head and queer romance, and I've done Holmes and Watson uh, mysteries and, you know, I've written them as a queer couple as well. Uh, so I've got the books The Adventure of the Colonial Boy and A Dream to Build a Kiss on, as my Sherlock Holmes uh, passion projects, I guess, and they're through Improbable Press. Uh, I had a ghost crime story called Jane, which won uh, a prize at the Scarlet Stiletto Awards one year from Sisters in Crime. Uh, and recent books have included uh, a collection called Scar Tissue and Other Stories, a rock and roll um, adventure with music against the vampires, basically, called Kitty and Cadaver. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I write a lot of different kinds of stuff, but I'm very much uh, a Sherlock Holmes tragic is the term that's getting used. But I've been a massive fan 
of, of Sherlock Holmes uh, since the 80s when I discovered the Granada TV series. Um, and the only one in the world is the first Sherlock Holmes anthology um, that I've uh, done. In fact, I pitched the idea for the anthology to my publisher, Clandestine Press. And it was very successful. Um, it's a wonderful book. And if they like the idea and they- Oh, beautiful. Oh, sorry. I've done it as a reason for that. Oh, sorry, my connection's gone a bit dodgy. No, I, I can take over if it, uh, if it does if it if it falls over. <laughs> it's just warning everyone tonight. I've got slightly um, my internet connection's just been a little flaky. We don't know why. So every now and then, and, if I fall quiet, Lucy will take over. So we've, like just had a, we've just had a thunderstorm too, which doesn't help. Yes. <laughs> but it was exciting. Um, so yeah, like the, the, the book, um, The Only One in the World, was effectively inspired by the question, what would Holmes and Watson be like if they'd come from a completely different culture, maybe even a different time period in a different culture? Um, so how would that culture redefine who they were as characters? Um, and in what ways would they stay the same? So what's effectively kind of what's essential about Holmes and Watson across all these different sort of ideas and how far can you serve those characters up with a twist and yet still recognize them as the original. So I asked writers from all over the world to explore those questions and those ideas. And I was so delighted that when I asked Lucy, uh, who I've known for, for a long time to, um, to participate, she leapt in with both feet, that's fantastic. Uh, Lucy herself is an award-winning writer, uh, like me, across many, many genres, including children's fiction, science fiction, horror. Um, Lucy's worked as a librarian, researcher, editor, a columnist, reviewer uh, for the Age in the West Australian, and she and I both um, wrote Sherlock Holmes stories that appeared in uh, a collection called Sherlock Holmes, the Australian Casebook. So yeah, we've got a bit of a, a history together. So welcome, Lucy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as well. Nice. So I, my first question I wanted to ask you is, uh, what were your thoughts when I first approached you and said, would you like to contribute? Uh, well, I knew I'd have to do something entirely different from the previous Sherlock Holmes story. Um, but it was a real, real challenge because Sherlock Holmes in another era and not, you couldn't have a Holmes and Watson that were both white Anglo-Saxon Saxon Protestant males. You had to vary the mix. And this actually is why there were so many interesting takes in the book because you could, people could move it to Japan, New Orleans. Um, they could, they could, um, have indigenous protagonists, um, Russia, Germany, going back in history. And so I started thinking, well, what can I do? Well, there was one very easiest answer because I'm also a researcher in the history of crime fiction. And one of the things I'm interested in is how true crime goes into, in, becomes crime fiction, how it inspires it, how it gets. And it so happened that there really was a genuine Holmes in the 1600s in England, uh, who, ha who happened to be female. Um, her name was Anne, her maiden name was Holmes. She married and her husband was murdered and she solved his murder. How she did this was that they had no police at the time and nor did they actually have criminal lawyers. You would have lawyers in cases of treason or theft, um, but the, the legal system was completely different, but they did, and the word detective didn't even exist. So she had to go around um, England in the middle of the plague, uh, looking up, basically interviewing witnesses and, um, and collecting information because there was no role for the detective police and people who didn't have money, and she was a former lady's maid and who'd been left a widow, um, she, you had to do it all yourself. Rich people could hire what were known as thief takers, which is like proto-detectives. Um, only the trouble was with thief takers was that sometimes they were organizing the thieves who stole your silverware in the first place. Um, but she was, she, so, she, so she went around to London and Essex in the middle of the plague and 
um, collecting, collecting evidence and um, did in fact bring her husband's killer to trial. And I have a note here that that took her um, 13 years to do that. Yeah. That's, she's a persistent lady. Oh yes, absolutely obsessive, and um, and it sort of she survived um, regime change in England from Oliver Cromwell to Charles II, and um, it was and you think that women in the past were, you know, completely. She's been obscured, but my God, she was tough. And mm. so I was going to for, ask because you know we do get this very um, narrow perception of what. The past was like sometimes we, we feel a bit too informed by maybe what um, white television makers have presented from us for to us from the past. But you know how unusual was that for the time that what what Anne achieved? The thing is, you look at the past and you have you have a received history of the past, and then you look at it and you discover that that people were stranger um, and more like us than you can imagine. Um, and that there are all sorts of interesting people. There are women pirates. Um, there are women who disguise themselves as soldiers and fought in wars. Um, and you know, there was there was playwrights. There were spies. Um, you know, the, the Queen of England even led an army in, during the English Civil War. Um, Henrietta was married to Charles I. So that there was. A lot of roles. Now, do you want me, do you want me to do my sl little slide? I do. I was about to say, like, Lucy has actually um, collected some images uh, that relate to this story that she did. And like I said, I was so fascinated by the fact that um, Anne Holmes was a real person operating at a time when, you know, perhaps you wouldn't necessarily think um, a woman like that could. But uh, Lucy's put some stories together, some information together to share. Uh, here we hey, go. Can you see that now? I can see that. I'm hoping everybody else can. Okay. Well, so that's that's just my title page. <laughs> All right. This is the story of this is the story of Anne, and um, this is from a pamphlet from the 1680s, um, in which is describing her going interviewing a witness, um, which actually happens to take place in a pub, and so she's speaking to this man, and he said, "Oh yes." Um, Yes, we saw this person. He was a tall, big, portly man with his own hair, dark brown. By that, they meant he didn't wear a wig. Dark brown, not very long, curled up in the, the ends. Um, and she says, that was my husband. Um, and which is quite surprising. You wouldn't think a woman would do this, but they did. We know of Anne and we know of others. Um, one of the most important things about Anne and what gave her agency was that she was a widow. Um, and I don't know what she looked like. There's no image. But conventionally, women, if they could afford it, wore black. And it was a very expensive colour. But they'd wear a veil over their head, which was affixed with a kind of triangular um, bit of Sort of, of fabric which went over the brow and this is what the expression the widow's peak comes from mm. um, and this woman um, her, she's been widowed twice same woman first time she's marriageable so she's she might be a widow but she's showing off her cleavage second <laughs> time she's beyond such things um, so and I just bring this up for I think the most wonderful image of a widow that I found this is actually from Dutch painting and it summed up the what I felt about Anne as a person except that I think that she was a much tougher um, she really grew but she was she could be hard as nails when she wanted to be mm. um, now okay so I had my I had so I had my Holmes who really was a Holmes what about my Watson well mm. if he's well if it's somebody who's got to be different and they couldn't be um, white, well, who could they be? Ah, well, this one very obvious answer. And these were the Africans who were in England at the same time who were working as mostly as servants for titled people, rich people. And you can see a couple of images here. They haven't quite been, in some cases, they've been literally erased from history. The lady in the green frock, that image at the back, was painted over 
possibly because her descendants became anti-slavery activists and only restoration proved it. The other one of the Lady of Brown is a much more conventional image. Um, but there is no real way of these people and Africans in England at the time are like status symbols. So, but this, but what they were is extremely uncertain. They could be slaves, slavery was just beginning, but they could be servants. They could be people who'd been freed. Um, but um, there were, if we go by the printed painted evidence, there are a lot of them, they've left, they've left descendants. And some of those people are turning up in DNA even now. So there is quite a substantial history. Mm. But in this position, they're in a very subservient. Um, and I don't like that for my Holmes and Watson, um, who actually I did call Watson. And so um, I th what's a, a, a closer image of their relationship is in this which is about a century later. And this is an extraordinary image because you can see that the two women are friends, possibly more, but they're on equal status. They're both beautifully dressed and they are at least friends. Hmm. So, and it's interesting with this picture because like in the previous, um, in the second of the previous pictures, the boy is, the, the young man is serving the woman, but here it's the white woman who's got the lap full of fruit and clearly her friend has selected um, a piece from that. So there's, you know, there's um, all sorts of variations in how that relationship is portrayed here. And the way that, you know, the, the black girl is looking directly at us. Oh, yes. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting image and nobody really knows, this, knows the story behind it. So I'll stop my share and um, get back to it. But just as a, a general comment, when you're thinking yourself in writing the past, and this is the sort of thing you can do in lockdown. You might remember the people were doing cosplay with um, what you have at home. Mm -hmm. So I thought of doing a cosplay with what I had at home for the mid, mid 17th century. Um, and this isn't so hard. So you need dangling earrings. Uh, that's one thing. You draw your hair back. Um, trouble is for a widow, I went looking for things that approximated a widow's peak like little bits of lace and I put them on my head and it looked as if I was wearing my underwear and I thought that is not a very good idea. Um, however, I was able to find my a hat from the 1960s, which you put on it at a jaunty angle, just like Rubens, um, famous picture of his sister-in-law. And then, um, because they wore big, big, big lace collars, this is my great aunt's um, tablecloth and you fix it with a rosette like that and I found an absolute a painting uh, from the 1700s in which a woman had exactly this style of rosette and so you can cosplay at home even in lockdown and get into the spirit okay so you can all your get, your Ann, get your Anne Kidderminster on and go and solve yourself a murder during a plague and an interesting thing about the plague is that they wore masks because they didn't understand how infection happened. They didn't know what it was. At one stage, I think they killed off all the cats and dogs because they mm. thought they were infect the infective um, vector. Um, they didn't know it was fleas, but um, they were they they they, they wore masks because they recognised that uh, you you could actually um, that was a means of protection. And when they and also they put money into vinegar. So if money changed hands, they put it in the, the only real antiseptic they had, which was vinegar. So you drop your money into, into vinegar and the person you bought the port from would, um, would, and they also would pull it out. And they also practiced isolation because if you were, if you got the plague and it wasn't like COVID because you had you know, great black lumps all over you, um, you'd be shut in your house and there'd be a watchman to make sure you couldn't get out. But the watchman would bring food to the door. So, yeah. and you were basically doing parallels of the past. Absolutely, it's exactly like it, it's it's a, it's quite alarming. Things do not change. But enough of that. Yeah. Let's talk about the book. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say that because you know we've got um, thirteen different stories with these um, no, with all these different versions of Holmes and Watson. Um, 
And, you know, like I said, you know, part of that idea was like, how far can you take them from Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, original characters and still have them be recognizably Holmes and Watson? So um, I guess I was thinking for, for you, thinking about your um, Holmes and Watson, that how, what do you think are the key similarities between your characters and those original ones? Um, well, Anne is highly intelligent um, and can think on her feet. Um, in that scene I just showed earlier, she realizes that the person she is interviewing is actually wearing her husband's hat, died. Um, and, but she's not been educated. We know she can read and write, which was a little unusual at the time. She's not self-consciously clever. Um, like Holmes, who's very fond of saying that he's the, you know, he, ha he has a, a great brain. I'm sorry, that was Bravo. Um, yeah. but, um, but people recognize her intelligence. With my Watson, um, he is not he because he's a doctor, but doctors were drawing on the natural world and they were examining the herbs. So he's interested in herbalism. Um, and so in this story, I actually took a real case from the following century, which was too good not to use. <laughs> well, come on. Yeah, that's there were great good. stories in real life, and they really deserve to be turned into fiction. <laughs> life is fantastic for cannibalising for our stories. One of the things I really liked about how you portray your Holmes and Watson is that they are, you know, they're both um, in kind of unusual circumstances. They are both servants for... Um, sort of quite significant figures, but they are both in different ways. They're quite um, outside the social norms, um, you know, to the degree that that Anne is is a, a woman who is a thief taker, and that Watson is um, a black servant. So he's not a, a slave, but he's you know uh, um, perhaps what we might think is not necessarily um, associated with a kind of uh, justice of the period. So yeah. you know, yeah. They're not formally integrated by the justice system, but they had, I had the idea of making them have continuing adventures in which they are employed by the Lord Chief Justice of England, um, who, did, who in historical life, he did Justice Bridgman, he did have an association with Anne and he helped her um, find her husband's killers. But, it's, but they're friends. And that's the most yeah. important thing about Holmes and Watson is they're very different people who maintain a, who maintain a relationship, which is purely which is purely friendly, um, and that they are support for each other. So when you're doing Holmes and Watson, no matter what their circumstances, it's about a friendship. Yes. Yeah, I've always said for me, Holmes and Watson's about that that duality, the, the the dual attractions of having strange adventures and this great friendship. And however that friendship may be um, extrapolated or perceived, um, the friendship's at the heart of that relationship and, and then going off and, and, you know, discovering bizarre things. I've always figured, like, who doesn't want a best friend you go off and, and you know, have rollicking good adventures with? I think that's, you know, for me, that's always been one of the, the great appeals uh, of, of those characters and those stories and why they've lasted so long. Um, so my next question was, I guess, you know, we've looked at how similar they are. What do you think, you know, quite apart from the, you know, they've got, uh, you know, we've got a, a female Holmes and we have a black Watson. So that they're really obvious differences. But what do you think are the other major differences between your versions of these characters and their origins? They're not privileged um, either by race or by gender. So they're operating at the margins and... They do not actually have a, the ability to be as free agents as much as Holmes and Watson does. And the only way I could make a free agent would be if I would do something like um, a, attach it to a historical figure who really discovered crimes. But there's no, there's no real, there's no real equivalent um, at that time. Um, you get the following century. You get. Um, you, you get much more documented thief takers and you get um, the Bow Street runners. So mm. things like that start, but at that time, there's really, there's, there's not that degree of investigation because they didn't really need it. In my, it was, 
in a, most people, if there was a murder, most people knew who'd done it fairly quickly because they were living in small communities um, and there wasn't much doubt about it. But it's really only when you get the big cities and full of strangers that there's real doubt. And that's when the, that's when you need investigators. In, in, like, in talking about the fact that those two characters, as you've written them, don't have the, the, the white male middle class privilege that we see in Conan Doyle. Uh, like for me, that's actually one of the key that comes down to the essences as an editor what I was hoping to find from these stories, because, you know, figured in any other cultures, there's going to be different ways in which that kind of how those two people can move through their worlds. And if you've got different cultures and all these different pressures and expectations, it is going to change uh, what they're able to do and how they're able to relate to each other through that. So like one of the joys for me as an editor was exactly that thing, Lucy, that, you know, you've, You've brought these two characters together, but there, you know, there are those um, links that you can go back. You can see a thread to the original Conan Doyle characters, but you can also see here's a whole new dynamic because you have shifted them in their place in society, and they still work as a, as these two friends who are solving a crime together, and with a bit of humour as well because Conan Doyle. Um, Absolutely. People, yeah. I think people forget that Conan Doyle could be, you know, his stories, his Holmes and Watson stories were often quite funny. Oh, yes, and the dialogue and the it and the character, the way the characters rub up together, that's good fun. But I mean, one of the things about this book is you can see the different ways in which the characters can play out. And so and one of my favourites is Kerry Greenwood and David Gregg, who set a story in um, in medieval Iceland um, and made it and um, Kerry is a woman of much erudition and so is David and they managed to be true to the spirit of the Icelandic sagas while also having a, a rollicking good crime story. Yeah. So there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff here that um, you learn a lot about different cultures um, and yeah I mean we've got one story the affair of the purloined rent boy. Um, <laughs> yes. Our, our book opener, set in New Orleans. Um, and yeah, it's playing with the ideas of, of Holmes and Watson, and that's and that's a good deal of fun. And we need, and let's face it, we need a bit of fun in life. We do, we do. Alex, so again, you know, just as an editor, it was very much my my approach was that having said this is the outline, I want different cultures, who are they? when they come from those different cultures. So I approached people who had knowledge of or experience of, you know, um, or lived experience of those cultures and then didn't dictate anything else. You know, so I said, look, you can change gender, you can change orientation, all that sort of stuff, because you know best what's going to serve a story told in that culture, which is your expertise. And so we got such an amazing array of stories and one of my favorites is uh, Natalie Conyers I mean I'm going to stop here and say they are in fact all my favorite do not make me choose a favorite child there are no favorite children but one of the things I loved about Natalie's is that she went off in such a completely different direction um, so Natalie's uh, has Polish background and so she wrote uh, a story about uh, based on this, this Polish folklore about the people of Helm, um, where all basically all the very foolish people um, ended up living. And so Dr. Watson, uh, the, the, the Watson character, goes to see Helm because he wants to see if people really are as stupid as he's heard. And that's when he meets Sherlock Holmes. So there's this very funny story, very much influenced by Polish folk folklore, and yet still recognisably Holmes and Watson, recognisably with that kind of dynamic, even though there's Sherlock Holmes in, in that story, he's not even a quarter as smart as he thinks he is. So, yeah, I mean, do you have, uh, given that we don't like to play favourites, do you have a favourite? Uh, I think I think it is Kerry and David's story. It really is. I love that, and it was so much fun working with with them on that one. Particularly, uh, again, as I'm saying, you know, I have to trust that my writers they uh, and trust in their knowledge of the culture that they're working with. So, um, in editing, I had to you know, there's negotiating a few things with that and making sure that you know I can't change something that's meant to reflect uh, a cultural truth. Um, so we have to negotiate it. And in this particular case for, for David and Kerry's story, we couldn't give the Sherlock Holmes avatar character 
a name that sounded like Sherlock because it was just not Viking, Icelandic Vikings just don't have names like that. So the, the names for the Holmes and the names for the Watson had to be what would be appropriate um, for people in that, um, that world. Uh, and then we, so we had to tease out other ways to make him, to make the characters, to keep that connection with the original. Because you know, for a lot of the time you can use the name and it's really clear who that character um, is an avatar for. So here we had to bring out other aspects of uh, including um, having the Holmes character playing the Viking version of a violin, a stringed instrument. So it was a, it was a really interesting challenge in, in some ways, but uh, it was really good to, to have writers who actually really got what I was asking for so we could like tease out um, those expressions and but still keep really true to what those uh, those cultural uh, influences are that change the characters. If you'd like to tell the the um, viewers why you're wearing a bee around your neck. Ah, oh. uh, yeah, it's it's totally Sherlock Holmes's fault that I've got a bit of a bee thing happening. So um, yeah, so I, I don't know how many of you um, listening are people who have read or, or Sherlock Holmes tragics like me, but the, the, there's a whole thing. Uh, and like with many of the, uh, the elements of Sherlock Holmes mythology, it's, a, it's an element that's only mentioned once or twice. It's not like it um, features largely in the story, but Sherlock Holmes basically wants to just retire. When, when he's finished solving crimes, he, he retires to Sussex uh, to the, down, the Sussex Downs so he can raise bees uh, and study them. And in canon, there's in, in the original stories, there is a little handbook about um, uh, describing the, the behaviours of the queen bee. Uh, the, the, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the book now. What a tragic, I can't to not remember the name, but it's about the segregation of the queen. And um, so there's this whole kind of bee aspect <laughs> to Sherlock Holmes, which, you know, if you're feeding that in with environmental concerns today about uh, diminishing and vanishing bee populations through Sherlock Holmes, through some of the home stuff I've read and through some of the fan fiction, because there are people who really latch onto the bee idea. I've learned a lot about bees. I've come, become quite fond of our fuzzy little bee friends. And uh, so I own or have made uh, a bit of bee jewelry <laughs> in recent years. So this one I picked up in, uh, in Wales, actually. Um, quite uh, some years ago, back when we used to travel to other countries. Uh, and hopefully it actually we'll... pertains, sorry, but it actually pertains to what happened with the book's design as well. Oh, yes, of course. Um, we were, uh, the our beautiful cover by Judith Russell. Uh, and I'm just going to see if I can share um, that with you. Let me see. I can hold it up if you don't. Yeah, I was going to do that, but I keep getting that. I'm going to share the full cover. Let's see, has that come up? Not yet. Um, oh, it says I'm sharing the screen. Uh, here we go. I to, I'm, I'm holding it up so people can go. see. Has that not worked? Uh, I'll have to stop there because it... Yes, hold up your cover. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. So we have this beautiful cover that was designed by Judith Russell, but this was our second go at the cover. The problem is that asking a writer to give an idea for what should be on a cover mainly demonstrates why I'm a writer and not an artist. And so my, ori my original idea was I was trying to think of maybe we could have kind of like a cabinet of wonders, a wonder co cover, which had little things on all the shelves that came from all the stories. Um, and we tried that, but the, the result was quite dark. It was a bookshelf. And we just had another anthology coming out with Clandestine Press, which also had bookshelves on it. And it was... Uh, it basically didn't work, which was no fault of the artist. She was doing beautiful work. Um, but one of the, uh, the pictures that she drew uh, was of a bee, a Sherlock Holmes bee, uh, which was originally assigned to Lucy's story uh, because I didn't quite, I went, oh, oops, no, Lucy's story has not bees in it. <laughs> Wasps are quite different. So we, we told the artist. Wasps. Yes, bees, bees are fluffy and cute. Wasps ha, ha, are not fluffy and have waists. 
air. Yes, they're nasty, nasty. So, you know, fortunately, because we've had to approach a new, uh, uh, an artist to do this new kind of cover, but Andrea Farley, who was doing the, uh, all these beautiful, um, gorgeous little diagrams of, of all these things for each story, we sort of said to her, oops, actually, that should be a wasp. Um, so all of her, we got to keep all of her beautiful artwork and we've put them on the, um, the pages, the facing pages for each of the story. So you'll be able to see, you know, there's an electric guitar for the Japanese homes and there's, uh, you know, so there's all these things through the book. And so we kept the bee that she'd made and we've popped that at the back of the book where all the busy little bees where we have all the author biographies. So we still have beautiful bee artwork there. So there's some beautiful pieces. So yeah, like it's just, the, the, I don't have a story in it, so I can say without being too um, embarrassed or, or um, skiting uh, that I think every story is absolutely magnificent. We have such a gorgeous cover and we have such beautiful artwork um, illustrating every single story in it as well. So it's just a, a glorious package and I'm really proud. We had a review in the Australian, the Weekend Australian, which called our book smart, entertaining and fresh. And I sort of, I feel like I need to have that tattooed somewhere on my body. It's so entertaining <laughs> and fresh. So it was very exciting. We're really, really pleased um, with that. But yeah, so like the bee motif is carrying through and it's in the book as well. And would you ever do this again? I've already pitched um, several more anthologies <laughs> to Lindy. So um, yes, I'm working on, um, I'm co-editing uh, a different we haven't made any formal announcements of these yet, but I'm co-editing one anthology with um, Atlan Merrick, who has a story in this collection. I'm um, I'm also editing a completely different uh, uh, anthology on a different topic, and I've just been approached by someone uh, who made her own pitch to Clandestine Press for a horror anthology, and she's asked me to co-edit that with her. So like, you know, like I've, I've done one, I've co-edited one book once, I love the experience so much that I'm down. I'm do, I've got three coming that I'll be working on next year. You'll just, you, you just have to clone yourself. <laughs> I, well, I, maybe I just have to like stop doing this actual working for a living and just focus on all the writing and the editing because like, I, I do love it. I have so enjoyed that process of working with all of you guys and all, 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 all of you writers for the only one in the world. So I'm, I'm really hoping I can replicate the joy of that experience. One, one happy editor, that's what we like to see. <laughs> I'm, I'm well content. Um, we're, we're only a little ahead of time, but maybe we can start now. I don't know if anybody has posted any questions yet, but um, if you have any questions, um, our lovely people out there, you'd like to ask either Lucy or me about Sherlock, about writing or about the editing process, anything like that, please feel free just to uh, pop a little question in there and we'll, we'll see, um, we'll get to it. Um, oh, okay, so we've got our first question which is uh, why was the thinking behind privileging an author's authorised connection with culture rather than gender or class? Why can middle-class writers, for example, unproblematically write about working class characters, but not other cultures? Or why can men write women characters? That's a very kind of broad question. And it comes down to, in part, I guess, um, that idea of um, it's a lie to say, write what you know, because that, Depend, sometimes depends on a really narrow definition of what you know. In this particular instance, the building was just that I wanted a specific focus and I wanted it to be a really well-informed background. Um, so as a writer, I know what it is to be human. Um, I know uh, what it is to feel. There's a, you know, and all writers are the same. You can um, cross a lot of... Um, if I only ever wrote about people who are exactly like me, Every single one of my stories would just contain 200 characters who are white, overweight, middle class women who write for a living uh, and live in Melbourne. You know, look, you can be like it could be um, hopelessly narrow to think about it like that. But in terms of culture, you know, like um, it, I guess privileging is a word that you can use, but like certainly for people who come from those cultures now. So we have a writer from India. I couldn't. I don't believe that I could write as well as Jay did about how being Indian would influence those characters and their backgrounds and their behavior, because I'm not steeped in that culture. 
Um, even I, look, I have lived overseas. I lived in Poland for a year. I lived in Egypt for two years. Um, there are elements that I could do about that, but I'm not steeped in the culture to the point of understanding how to, with subtlety and um, with, uh, with grace and with a really kind of pinpoint accuracy, write what uh, a well-known character might be like, people like Sherlock Holmes, how being in that culture would alter his behaviour because there's just there's too much that I don't know um, because I'm not steeped in it. Now, if you came from, um, so, you know, somebody from, you know, my kind of background, maybe who'd lived in Egypt for 30 years, that might be a different matter because they'll have a much more subtle and full knowledge and understanding about all the different layers of society and all that sort of stuff. So in this particular instance, my focus was very much, I wanted to ensure that the stories were written by people who had a, a deep understanding of those changes. Now, either that understanding came from lived experience because they were from those cultures or um, uh, I guess st would studied experience be the word Lucy for people who had like Lucy's got expertise in research uh, and writing about the uh, you know different areas but her research skills gave and you know Lucy's been researching um, true crime women detectives real life women detectives for how long now Lucy? Oh, quite far too long, I suspect. I just wanted to say that I am writing about class because I'm writing about two people who are servants and working class. Um, and Anne is, uh, when she was, when her, when her husband vanished, she was obliged, she was pregnant, she was obliged to support her in one of the few ways that women could honestly with a baby, and that was to become a wet nurse. So she was feeding breastfeeding other people's children, rich people's children for living in, the, in a household. And we can't imagine doing something like that now, but you can research it and you can realize that actually it was quite a good job. You got good food and everybody was very anxious you wouldn't lose your milk. So they'd be nice to you. Oh, well, that's an interesting job, I guess. <laughs> Unexpected one. But yeah, so I mean, that's what it came down to is that um, because I wanted that kind of subtlety and deep understanding, that's the approach that I took to this uh, particular book this time. So thank you so much for your question, though. That was really cool. Uh, somebody has uh, just in the chat field um, asked a question about why I didn't do a story of my own because I was busy editing everybody else's beautiful stories. <laughs> And partly because when I, I wanted to write, I have actually written a version of Holmes and Watson um, as Australian Melbourneian hipsters, uh, which was published in a different collection uh, in America. And I might go back to them sometime. But for this particular case, I thought it would be, I, I was more interested to um, have a story that uh, in which an Australian Holmes and or Watson perhaps came from an ind indigenous background. And that's why um, I approached Raymond Gates, who again, like Lucy and I had appeared in the Sherlock Holmes, the Australian casebook anthology. So um, I, I knew he could write Sherlock Holmes and I knew he could write mysteries. And so I approached Ray and asked him um, to you know, right from that perspective. And he did a fantastic job because he's, you know, apart from anything else, he kind of avoided what might be considered stereotypical ways uh, of writing an indigenous um, Australian Holmes and Watson. So he like, he went off in a, uh, a completely new and different direction with a little tinge of horror, which um, actually also is in keeping because Conan Doyle's stories, things like The Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, the Crooked Man, uh, and there's a couple of other uh, of his stories. Um, the Speckled Band is another one where, you know, he's, he wrote supernatural and horror stories as well. So he's that, you know, again, each story has a different kind of link to the Conan Doyle originals, but Ray's story drew on some of those um, uh, traditions of horror storytelling that Conan Doyle used in some of his um, Holmes short stories as well. So that was great. So that's, yeah, maybe next time I'll, I'll do one. That'll be good. Uh, any more questions? So don't forget just to use the uh, the Q and A um, icon, which is at the bottom. Just hold your uh, hover your mouse down there if you want to see the Q and A icon. You can pop that up and um, bring some anything else in. Any more questions? It's a little quiet at the moment. Do you have a question for me, Lucy? 
Would you ever do this at great? I mean, would you actually do this in book in, in book length? Um, because there's a lot of crime fiction out there and that people are always looking for interesting protagonists and stories. So would you ever do this at book length? I mean, well, take, one, story. Yeah. take one of these kind of Holmes and Watson. Yeah. yeah. You got a pitch? Uh, let me think about that a bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm not the publisher. We'll have to talk to the publisher about that. But certainly if, if, if um, one of those writers or another writer read those books and thought, I've got this idea for... Um, because it's not, although this book is, is you know, it's lovely of the Australian to call it fresh, but the idea of Holmes and Watson coming from different backgrounds are not, isn't new. Um, I mean, quite apart from the, the Sherlock Holmes fan fiction writers have been doing it for a while, but in, in the actual film and television world, um, we have in elementary, um, we have a Watson played by Lucy Liu. So we have an Asian American woman playing a Watson there. So we've got a different kind of perspective um, on that one. There's, uh, there was a Japanese TV series called Miss Sherlock. Um, there've been um, different interpretations from different nations doing their own versions of Holmes and Watson. Um, so the idea has been around, it's just that I happen to have collected that idea into one anthology um, and with some like just such brilliant writers. So like it really showcased that concept to its absolute best. But, you know, I think, yeah, if you think you've got an idea, something that you, you know, think has got legs to go for a whole novel, it might be appropriate to approach clandestine press and uh, make a pitch and see what they say. Look out for their website and see when they're open for submissions. I think <laughs> I'm better to say that or my publisher will, will have a go. Um, Another question. <laughs> we've got two different questions. Uh, just very quickly, the audible question. Uh, I don't know if it'll come out in Audible and I don't know what we do about the accent. So that's not a really useful answer to your question. Uh, one of the things about um, recording um, stories and short stories is it's, you know, it's quite an expensive proposition. You have to pay a performer upfront. And in this case, you would be, I would imagine we'd want to maybe find um, performers from, you know, those backgrounds who could, uh, who could do the, the accents accurately. So, uh, you know, so that, that would be a big proposition. Maybe one day in the future, clandestine press will be uh, in a position where it can do audible books. That would be lovely. It's certainly, I know that we've chatted and that's something that um, they'd like to do sometime. Um, and there's, you know, some movement there, but it, it'll be time coming. Thanks for the lobbying. I'll pass it on to Lindy. Uh, speaking of whom, the next question we had in the Q&A field was um, somebody wanted to know more about clandestine press and sisters in crime. Uh, they're two different things. So, um, Lucy, do you know a lot about Sisters in Crime? Because I'm just gammering here. The crime has been running for about 20 years, and it's um, been supportive of women crime writers. It is both fanish and also writers. So it's readers and writers. It's had two conventions, um, which have been worked very well. It hosts the David Awards. Um, it, David Awards is named after Ellen Davitt, who was a, a woman educator in Melbourne in the 1850s and 1860s and 1870s. And she wrote the first known murder mystery novel, Force and Fraud. Um, and she's buried in Geelong because her husband had, had tuberculosis. He went to Geelong for the sea air um, and died there. And when she died many years later in Melbourne, there was money to take her ghost, her, her, her take her, that's a Freudian slip, to take <laughs> her corpse to um, Geelong to be buried beside him. And it is, if you ever go on the Geelong Cemetery Tours, you can see the monument she designed for the both of them, which is really very striking based on the Ark, Ark of the Covenant. So that's for Emerging, that's for women writers of crime in Australia. Um, and beside, beside that, the Sisters in Crime also has the Scarlet Stiletto Awards, which is for short stories, and that's been running a number of years. They've had anthologies from that, but a number of people have, through winning the award, have really gone on to careers. Kate Kennedy, um, who was a... Um, Best known as a mainstream novelist, but boy, can she write crime when she wants to. And uh, Tara Moss, 
mm -hmm. um, other people. So it's kind of like a support system for women writing crime in Australia, because let's face it, Australia began as a convict colony and we've been fascinated by it for over 200 years. We have, we do love a bit of murder. <laughs> not necessarily to commit ourselves, but uh, I'm not going to rule anything out at this point. Uh, in terms of clandestine press, Alex, so I'm, I'm going to put some words in Lindy Cameron's mouth because uh, she's not able to, I don't know if she's here tonight, but um, so, but we've been friends for a really, really long time. Uh, Lindy Cameron is herself a, a writer of crime fiction, among other types of fiction. Uh, and um, I'm trying to think how old the press is now. So it's at I least... Guess. 10 maybe 10 years but she um she just sort of felt that there were um uh that writers weren't getting published because they weren't maybe necessarily mainstream or you know like a big publisher things but like certainly with um the advent of print on demand and ebooks and things like that that it's possible perfectly possible and and um uh for a small business to do small print runs um, so there's actually quite a number of small presses that have popped up um, around the world and in Australia, um, places like 12th Planet Press over in Western Australia, which did really, really well. So clandestine press um, came up in part out of that Lindy's desire to um, provide more publishing opportunities for Australian writers. Uh, and because she's been involved with Sisters in Crime for, and is one of the conveners. So uh, I guess part of her focus was to do was to help support um, women writing Australian women writing crime, but she doesn't publish only women. She doesn't publish only crime. Um, clandestine press um, refers to itself as uh, the, your, your meeting all your genre needs. So they do horror, science fiction, fantasy, um, as well as crime and like I said, the mashups. Um, so um, she's been publishing me for, for quite a number of years now. So like, we have a very good working relationship uh, and uh, do well together. Um, so yeah, so you can always, you know, if you're thinking about um, something that you'd like to write or, or look at, go and have a look at Clandestine's website, have a look at um, what it says about submission guidelines. Do look and wait and see um, when submissions may be open. Um, you know, they uh, any publisher, large or small, has to kind of manage how often um, new manuscripts come in because it's really easy to get absolutely swamped and have like 2,000 manuscripts and there's only two people running the press. So that's going to probably take the rest of their lives just to read that day's intake. So you've got to have a look of, um, uh, of doing that. Can I um, tell you how text publishing deals with that? Yeah. Text publishing, which is a um, yeah, Melbourne publisher who published Gary Disher and other people. What, I'm not sure if this is still the procedure, but for a while they would have one day a week, they'd all go into the, in, into the boardroom with all the manuscripts that had gone in, and this is like the head of the press, the editors, the um, just about everybody, and they'd go through and they'd go for the manuscripts which had come in, which was the slush pile, and they'd start reading. And so everybody, so everything that got in came in and got read on that one day of the week, and and so everybody was involved. It's a little bit like the Tom Sawyer's painting the fence party only for manuscripts. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, Maybe you not. could say that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, look, if you, by the way, if you're interested, um, I'm just going to pick this up for you. Um, Clandestine Press has got a daughter press as well called Improbable Press. Um, and so they uh, were originally, Improbable Press was originally did Sherlock Holmes uh, fiction and was based in the UK uh, and then clandestine acquired that a couple of years ago and Atlan Merrick who um, uh, wrote the story Sherlock in in um, the only one in the world is the commissioning editor for that so I'm just going to add into the chat here we've recently I say we because I'm helping organize that clandestine press and improbable press have put together uh, a new YouTube channel called Clan Improbable. So there's a link there in the chat room. So if you want to have a look, we've got um, Lucy and a couple of the other authors from The Only One in the World reading extracts. Um, there's a new um, anthology come out from Clandestine called Who Sleuthed It? about animal sleuths. So cats and dogs and uh, not just cats and dogs, other kinds of critters as well, birds, um, solving crimes. Any oh, I've just been reminded I've put that to the wrong 
names, there we go. Uh, and there's a new um, Improbable Press is doing cryptid anthologies and we are going to be doing some more kind of advice kind of um, videos as well. So there's some videos there with advice on, you know, how to um, make sure that if you're submitting a story to uh, an anthology, for example, you know, you, you do what you need to do to make sure that the uh, the editors will read it and stuff. So there's some writing advice in there as well. So if you feel like it, go and you can subscribe to that channel and find out more about Clandestine Press and the work that we're doing and extracts, you know, people reading extracts from these stories, the only one in the world, uh, and there'll be more coming as well. Uh, and somebody uh, previously asked about a hardcover for the only one in the world. If you want to go to um, the only uh, to the clandestine press website, you can get the only one in the world as hardback or paperback or um, in either of the two ebook formats, which is Moby for Kindle and EPUB for um, every every other kind of e-reader. I feel like I'm sounding very much like an ad just now. So uh, it looking... wonderful ebooks because everybody can around the world can read them. Um, yeah. No matter. And I had the experience of I'd had a book out on um, Fergus Sheeran, the crime writer, and the first feedback I got out when it was um, published was that there was a um, gentleman in France who liked crime fiction. And I was writing about the history of Melbourne's crime writer, Fergus Hume, who wrote Mystery of the Hansom Cab. He had insomnia. So he thought, hold on. So he got, basically, he bought an EPUB, e-publication of the book, and sat up reading it all night. And then the next morning, um, he sent me a message to say how much he'd enjoyed it. Oh, lovely. That's good. I love, like, you know, e-books. I must have, like, no one's asked this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, I don't have a preference for paperback or ebook. Um, I, I've always maintained that because uh, there are elements about holding books, which is really nice, but not every book smells good. Now, some do, but like some kind of have grotty a, old pulps from the 50s smell yeah, terrible. They're a bit nasty, but even some new books have got like nasty chemical smells. Um, and of course, I've got with my um, e reader, I've put it in a cover so I, I can hold it like a book. It, it opens up so I have that feel with it. Plus, with my eyesight deteriorating as I get older, I can make the font larger when I'm having a very tired eye day. So, I could, in the end, for me, a good story will not be made worse. You know, you can't make a good story bad by changing the format that it's presented in. You can't make a story that you're not enjoying any more enjoyable by printing it on a piece of paper. You know, the quality of the story will shine through. There'll be other aspects that may affect, you know, whether or not you prefer ebooks and paper books and, and, and every, you know, whatever your preference is your preference and it's absolutely fine. But I see neither of them as superior. I have um, 12 pages of ebooks I haven't got quite all around to finish reading at the moment but I also have shelves full of books but I live in a small flat so I can't keep every paperback uh, or hardcover that you know so special books things that have been signed by the author um, or things that I have a, a special relationship with stay in uh, I actually keep those in a bookshelf in my house um, and others then I'll go and recycle through little libraries or I share with other people but uh, um, but yeah you know, ebooks I can uh, I've, I've never stuck if there's a train breakdown or I get stuck in, you know, uh, an airport or something because with my little e-books, I always have something to read. It's lovely. Um, I guess much, we're, we're, we're pretty much at the end, aren't we? We are. So like, I've got little notes about my outro, about how to say farewell to you all. First of all, I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us here this evening. And I hope you found it interesting and uh, entertaining, um, or that at least you enjoyed looking at the bee necklace. Um, and you've learned how to cosplay a 17th century thief taker with a tablecloth and a, and a you know, perky hat and a little rose rosette. That'd be lovely. Um, if you um, would like to read The Only One in the World, uh, obviously go to your library. I know that Geelong uh, Regional Libraries have got um, at least a copy. I don't know if they've got multiple. You could always ask for more. Um, but like any local library, if they don't have it in store, ask for them and they can uh, obtain that that's wonderful that's you know we all just we want our stories to be read so please go to your library for that if you'd like a copy of your very darling own um, you can get an ebook um, from the website or from um, most you know online uh, ebook retailers you can also get the paperback and the hardcover as I was saying before from clandestine but again from you know online um, booksellers as well so that's all 
um, available. I think the, if you just check the, uh, the chat section, we've got links there to Clandestine Press and we've got links there to that YouTube channel that I was talking about if you want to hear the authors reading some of their own work. And I read um, my story by candlelight. Yes, it's very period atmosphere. atmosphere. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, and so I think that's it on behalf of uh, Lucy and myself and, and, and Geelong Regional Libraries. Thank you again for joining us um, and have a wonderful evening. And uh, for those of us in Melbourne, uh, let's really enjoy going out, sitting and reading books in cafes once more. <laughs> And maybe tomorrow uh, at six o'clock, I think some of the bookshops will be actually opening their doors. You can tell wow. I'm a very excited. Shopping, person. shopping. Yay. So you can go shopping tomorrow. So thank yes, you so much. Thank you, thank you, and good night. <laughs>